No, thank you so much for having me. It's a huge honour and a great pleasure to be amongst uh, friends and colleagues and to uh, have this opportunity to speak to you about the research agenda and what's on the horizon. Um, so, and I, I just want to also thank Matthew and Stephanie for their generous hospitality. It's been a fantastic conference and uh, so well organised and it's a great pleasure to be here. So there are a few disclosures, none of which are relevant to what I'll be talking to you today. So just very simply, I'm going to break down a very complicated research agenda into three basic questions that I think as fear power researchers we grapple with every day. The first is to try and identify those people who are at higher risk of developing uh, malignant progression. The second is to develop new strategies of treating these patients and ideally drilling down onto bespoke medicine and finding targeted therapies that treat that patient's particular tumour successfully. And the third is to ideally prevent the disease metastasizing, and so to find it early and to, to be able to operate before it's already spread. So the main challenges facing the research community is, as mentioned yesterday, the heterogeneity of this disease. It's a very uh, different tumour from person to person. I think we badly need new preclinical models that we can use to rapidly prioritise new therapies as they come uh, down the pipe. And then thirdly, and this is something that the research community has discussed uh, a lot, and that's how we get together as researchers across different states, different countries, breaking down those barriers to be able to network successfully uh, to deal with rare cancers in multiple different settings. And uh, some of what I'll be talking to you today might sound like rocket science, uh, and, but really what I hope to leave you with is that the researchers just like you try to adopt common sense, which, as we all know, can, can often not be all that common. So the heterogeneity of disease, uh, there's a whole variety of different patterns that we look for and to try and make this disease more recognisable. I think one of the prime sources of heterogeneity, heterogeneity in fear powers is uh, that, particularly when metastatic, uh, SDHB metastatic disease does behave somewhat differently to so-called sporadic disease. So you know, I call it the Hamlet dilemma, to be or not to be, when I'm seeing my patients with malignant disease. And, but there are other sources of heterogeneity as well. So whether it's at a genetic level or epigenetic level or phenotypic level, and these different patterns and flavors of the way the disease presents and behaves uh, really is a great challenge for researchers because what physicians like when they're designing clinical trials is a homogenous disease. Uh, it's very easy to design clinical trials using uh, a homogenous group of patients. As soon as the disease gets heterogeneous, it becomes quite a challenge to account for all of the potential differences in how that might moderate treatment response. So research agenda number one, uh, determining drivers of metastatic progression. And I'll just present some new data on genetic information from what we call deep sequencing. Uh, and hope to leave you with the message that one of the uh, key uh, items that has been discovered from this uh, project is that telomeres are an important part of the way these tumours uh, behave uh, in metastatic progression. So on this slide, you'll see at the left uh, this uh, smorgasbord of genes that are involved with pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, and they fall into three clusters. That's been known for a long time. The cluster one, pseudohypoxic genes, uh, including BHL and the succinate dehydrogenase genes. And cluster two, the kinase genes, such as RET and NF1, TMM and MAX. And cluster three, which in fact Lauren Fishman in the audience first described and discovered uh, so, uh, other people sometimes call it cluster 2B, but these are wind altered genes. And, and that's the data from Lauren's paper and colleagues in Cancer Cell from the TCGA data set, showing that about a third of patients with FIO paras are carrying a, a gene that drives the disease in a heritable way, what we call germline mutations. Nearly half are driven by uh, genetic mistakes that have occurred in just the tumour, what we call sporadic. Uh, sorry, somatic mutations. And there's relatively little that we don't know about the drivers of pheochromocytoma. So uh, really a rapid advance in discovery of the genetic basis of this disease. And sometimes the genetic basis is heritable and sometimes it's not. Uh, but 
this uh, jigsaw puzzle has been rapidly filled in with new discoveries. So in the next uh, 10 minutes or so, I'm going to focus on SDHB. Um, it only accounts for about 10% of all pheochromosotoma and paraganglioma, but it's overrepresented in metastatic cases. So approximately 40% of all metastatic pheoparaganglioma uh, is related to underlying mutations in SDHB. But what's become apparent, particularly over the last uh, five to 10 years, is that SDHB alone is not sufficient for uh, metastatic progression. So although it's a strong risk factor for malignancy, it's not the only thing that sets malignancy up. And this, this really drove a partnership of the American-Australian Asian Adrenal Alliance, the A5, uh, to uh, ask two, uh, two key questions. What are the genetic changes required to drive metastatic progression? in SDHB-associated pheochromosotoma and paraganglioma? And secondly, can metastatic progression be predicted in this uh, group of patients? And uh, that brought a large number of investigators together, led, of course, by Carol Pachak, um, but I'd also like to acknowledge my friend and colleague, Richard Tuttle, from the University of Melbourne, and Lauren Fishbun, who's in the audience. But you can see an, a large number of, of investigators from America, naturally, but also Australia, New Zealand, and Sweden, uh, all of whom com have come together in partnership to try and tackle these two big questions. Uh, what drives the malignant behavior of SDHB disease? And, what, uh, uh, ca and can we predict and make use of that information to our patients' benefit? Uh, and you see that we, we've had generous funding from the FIA Power Alliance, and we've also had been well supported by the Power Difference Foundation, and also uh, from national funding from my country. So uh, just here is Richard Tottle, and he leads the genomics lab in Melbourne and his team. Down there on the left-hand side is uh, Shiva uh, Bhattachanda and uh, Andrew Simpson, one of his bioinformaticians. Uh, sorry, Andrew Patterson, one of his bioinformaticians. And so there's a, this is complicated work. But just to illustrate what's been done already, the, it was an ambitious target to get 100 tumours and uh, submit those 100 tumours to a very detailed sequencing strategy. Uh, we aimed uh, to have 50 metastatic cases and 50 non-metastatic cases. These were all tumours that had associated SDHB mutations. And so, again, we're trying to narrow down the heterogeneity of the disease to try and make it more homogenous so that we are more successful in identifying the targets that we need to uh, discover new treatments. And just there are the platforms that have been used, whole genome sequencing, uh, uh, total stranded RNA sequencing, what we call RNA-seq, and uh, small RNA sequencing, and the methylation uh, data is just underway now. So this is employing very powerful genetic microscopes to really drill down on the whole genome of these tumors. Uh, so not just parts of the genome, but all of the genome, so the whole shebang. So it's, it's, it's like using the Hubble telescope to, to look down on these tumors. And uh, uh, the, due to the success of the partnership, and uh, in particular with uh, Dr. Pachak being the lead investigator and the enormous contribution that the NIH has made to this study, we've we, we reached our target, 97 tumors. The cohort accrual is now complete, that's the timelines um, starting in 2017. And th this year is gonna be incredibly busy because all of this data is now essentially complete and ready for analysis. It's a huge undertaking to look at this data. Uh, and it's not just the genetic data, we've gotta bring it together with the clinical data from all of the, the patients from whom these tumors have come and also the pathology data. So uh, my colleague Anthony Gill and Art Tischler uh, are going to be coordinating, looking at the tumors under the microscope, just the ordinary microscope, and pairing that data up with the information that's come from these sophisticated genetic analyses. So as I say, this year is going to be busy, but I'm going to share with you just the very top-line data uh, that we've noticed so far. And this, I, I acknowledge this is top-line data, but and there'll be a huge amount of data coming out of this study. But one thing that was immediately noticeable from the data so far is that telomeres, and I'll explain in detail what telomeres are, but telomere pathway dysfunction is a hallmark of metastatic uh, SDHB pheoparis. Now, let me just walk you through this some, somewhat complicated slide. If I can just direct you to this line here, top, uh, second from the top, 
And you can see in the red, uh, those patients in the group of 100 tumours who on the, in red have metastatic disease, and in green have disease that had not metastasized. And in the middle is a gray uh, zone, and those are patients for whom follow-up had been too short to determine whether or not they uh, had metastatic disease. Now let me draw you, your attention down to this, these two lines, and, and you'll see, I hope visually, that those patients who had metastatic disease uh, were very frequently associated with mutations in one of two genes, ATRX, uh, and the other gene, TERT. And uh, the significance of those two genes will be apparent in the next couple of slides. They're both genes that serve to regulate the ends of chromosomes, the telomeres. And let me just uh, walk you through what telomeres are. I'll just come back uh, to the previous slide in a minute. But telomeres are ends of chromosomes. So this is a chromosome, and the telomere is the very tip of the, the chromosome. And it so happens, as we all age, the telomere shortens. So telomeric shortening is one of the cardinal manifestations of natural aging. Cancers overcome that, and part of the uh, f um, drive to become uh, immortal as cancer is to maintain the telomere length. If telomeres shorten in a cancer, the cancer cell dies. So the cancers deliberately develop strategies to maintain their telomeres uh, at an abnormal length and that allows the cancer to become immortal. So we call the genes that regulate uh, telomeres the immortality genes. And there are two particular pathways of uh, immortality for cancers. The first is by reactivating an enzyme called telomerase. This enzyme shown here at the bottom, and uh, it looks complicated, but it's very simple. It just adds on extra bits of DNA to the telomeres so that the telomeres don't shorten. And telomerase is highly expressed in our stem cells, the, st the cells that would naturally replenish our organs. And it's also the t telomerase is highly expressed in germ cells that uh, uh, are used in reproduction. But t telomerase is usually switched off as, as cells become differentiated and perform their adult function, uh, but can be reactivated in cancer. Uh, and the reactivation mechanisms I'll, I'll come to in the, pre in the next slide. In tumors lacking telomerase, um, but still maintaining their telomeres through another pathway called ALT, alternate lengthening of telomeres, and now we're getting a little bit complicated, but ALT is associated with mutations in ATRX, and telomerase is reactivated through two main mechanisms. Anyway, just, this builds on a growing uh, amount of data in the field. In fact, Lauren Fishman was the first to recognize this in 2015 in a paper that she and colleagues published in Nature Communications describing for the first time ATRX mutations in FIO paras. Uh, and then uh, Katarina Larsen's group in Sweden recognized that telomerase was highly expressed in metastatic FIO paras. And in my group, Trish Dwight, uh, recognized that structural, and with Richard Tottle, recognized that uh, telomerase could be reactivated by chromosomal rearrangement. And then the French group, due to Favier and Ampel Jimenez Rocaplo, uh, also identified this phenomenon that telomerase was frequently reactivated in patients with metastatic uh, disease. And so here are the two main mechanisms of telomerase reactivation in, the can in our cancers either chromosomal rearrangement of the TERP promoter, so a different bit of chromosomal material now switching telomerase on, or a little mutation in the DNA that creates a new sw on switch for telomerase. So relatively uh, comprehensive, but, uh, and hopefully not too detailed. It's, it, the take home message is simple. If telomerase is switched on, that's the way cancers grow and metastasize. So um, what do we do with that information? Well, there are, th there are really three immediate uh, translatable possibilities from this information. The first is that if we find tumors that have telomerase switched on, that's telling us that those cancers are likely to do badly. And as we discussed yesterday, it's possible to make use of that information now to identify patients who may need upfront aggressive treatment, what we'd call adjuvant therapy after their initial uh, surgery. So it's possible to make use of this information immediately in the design of future clinical trials for patients who are at the highest risk of developing metastatic disease. The second way we can immediately translate this knowledge is by using these particular genetic changes in blood tests by, and, and using those to monitor patients for 
the earliest signal of metasta metastases in what we call cell-free DNA. So this is not science fiction. We can do this in, in the very near future. But really, the third way that I'd like to uh, discuss the value of translating this information is understanding how we can use it to treat patients better. Uh, now, telomerase inhibitors are going to be difficult to, to use uh, to, to treat patients because uh, of the importance of telomerase in, in stem cells. So we're going to have to unpick the pathways upstream of telomerase to, in order to, to find new treatments. So uh, how are we going to do that? Well, um, a lot of biology of um, SDHB-related disease has been interpreted by what actually happens in the cell in the absence of SDHB. So if I can just direct your attention to the middle panel, if you lose SDHB, it's an enzyme, and it would normally convert succinate to fumarate. And if you lose that enzyme, one of the consequences, very strong consequences, is that the succinate levels go up in the cells, and they go up quite high. And a lot of the downstream biology of SDHB-related uh, fear paras can be directly traced back to the high levels of intracellular succinate. So it happens that we can measure the succinate in cells using this machine called a mass spectrometer. And uh, by measuring succinate in cells, we can actually now begin to say, well, this bit of the tumor behavior is related to the succinate levels being high. And this is not my data. This is from Susan Richter and Graham Eisenhofer in Dresden. And they've actually shown that measuring succinate in tumors actually correlates with the way those tumors are going to behave. So those tumors with high levels of succinate are more likely to metastasize compared to those tumors with lower levels of succinate. So here we have, again, a connection between modern measurements of, and fancy machines, but actually making a, a difference to understand prospectively how tumors will behave based on their intracellular levels of succinate. So succinate is quantitatively related to tumor biology. So now the key for the future research part of our platform is to join the dots between succinate and telomeres. And that is going to be a challenge, but we already have some very strong clues as to what those dots might need to be to be joined, to join succinate to telomeres. We can't turn off succinate and we can't turn off telomeres, but we sure as can target those middle steps and they're, you know, histone lysine demethylases or tetrahydrolases or proline hydroxylases. They're all names to you, but again, for a, a biologist and a clinician, these are things that we can actually get a hold on. And so once we've joined the dots between succinate and telomeres, I think we'll have a real opportunity to develop new targeted treatment strategies for patients with these diseases. So just moving on to agenda number two, developing new targeted therapies. There's been slow progress due, I think, to the lack of preclinical models, the heterogeneity of disease, and the scarcity of the tumor. So existing therapies, which were comprehensively discussed yesterday and which I won't go through in any detail, but what we're beginning to see in research led by Carol Pachak and Lauren Fishman uh, is a strong sense that there is a genotype-dependent response to therapy. So whether you're SDHB, you might respond better to a particular suite of therapies compared to if you've got malignant disease not related to SDHB, for which different therapies are required. Um, but what I think we're all grappling with in the research community is there's abundance of ideas of new treatments. The pipeline is you know, pretty extensive already. What we would like to do is test them in a preclinical environment, so either in cell lines or in animal models, before we take them to the clinic. In, in other words, using preclinical models to rapidly prioritize which of those therapies are likely to be successful in the human environment. So I've just summarized on this slide what I believe to be the principal models that already exist uh, at the NIH. Um, uh, Carol Pachak and Dr. Zhuang have pioneered the use of SDHB knockdown cells called MTT cells, which are a model of pheochromocytoma, uh, uh, and also recently published as the uh, HIF2 or EPAS knockout mice, which I think will be incredibly powerful tools for understanding paraganglioma. Uh, in Boston, there was the Weinberg Laboratory who published many years ago the NF1 knockout mice, which spontaneously developed pheochromocytoma. And Art Tischler has a human GIST model now in uh, prolonged cell culture, which is, is proving to be very useful. 
Hans Gay in Florida has uh, developed a human cell line called the Theo One cells, which uh, we're all looking forward to, to seeing. Uh, in France, the SDHB knockout mice don't develop uh, paragangliomas, but uh, Judith Favier and Anne-Paul jimenez Rocaplo have used the adrenal glands from these knockout mice to success. And finally, in Italy, Massimo Minelli and Elena Rapizzi have used uh, the NIH model, the SDHB knockdown MTT cells, but co-culturing them with other cells called fibroblasts. And it seems like co-culture might be a very useful way of reproducing a more robust uh, model of, of, of disease. But I, I put this slide up as it looks impressive, but we're all looking for better models. I think that this really is holding our field back. If we can find models that are closer to the human disease, then we can use those models to rapidly prioritize new therapy. And I think this is an, a research agenda item that the Fear Power Alliance has been looking very strongly at, and I'd wholeheartedly endorse that. Um, new models are urgently needed in this field. So this leads me to the final research agenda item, detecting fear powers early. And I think, again, this is something that is very powerful for the fear power alliance to come together in partnership with clinicians. It's, it's based on a very simple premise, and that is that metastatic disease is strongly related to how big the tumor is. The bigger the tumor is, the more likely it is to spread. So the corollary of that is we've got to find the disease early. We've got to find it small. That's our best hope of cure to take these tumors out before they reach the size beyond which they're starting to metastasize. So how do we find them early? We, we use the information we've got already from genetics uh, and also imaging. So genetics, heritable syndromes, about 30% of all patients with pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma will carry a gene that's heritable. So you'll see, you know, there's lots of different changes of the number of genes, 22 genes related to fear para, 16 of them are heritable, so it can be passed through families, and you can see them on that pie chart there. And if you're carrying one of these genes, it has implications not just for you and your recurrence risk and other tumors, but for your family members and also for reproductive counseling. So a very important study from France, which uh, was referenced uh, yesterday, but which I'll repeat today, I think has, is going to refocus uh, attention on, uh, on the importance of screening. So they looked at 20, 221 people with uh, mutations in SDHB, SDHD, or SDHC or BHL, and they essentially broke them into two groups for the analysis. The first group uh, were patients for whom return of the genetic diagnosis took many years back to the patient, so on average more than seven years. And on the other side, uh, a, a more recent uh, group for whom the return of genetic information was much more rapid, so less than 12 months. So it's, again, complicated data, but simple concept. We're comparing one group for whom ge the genetic basis of their disease was not returned to them in a timely fashion, compared to another group for whose genetic information was to return to them much more swiftly. And the results, I think, were extraordinary. And that is, if you return the results to the patient quickly and they had the opportunity of making use of that data in screening, their tumors were smaller, they had less metastases, and they survived. So this underscores the importance of genetic diagnosis, information back to the patient so that the patient can make use of that and get enrolled in a screening program that is designed to find these tumors early before they've metastasized. This is powerful data, and it's going to mean a lot to, I hope, organizations like the Fear Power Alliance that can disseminate the, this important data to the patient community. Get tested if you're at risk, and get screened if you're carrying these genetic variants. So there are logistic problems of screening. We need timely diagnosis at the heritable basis of fear paras. We need to capture all the family me members at risk. We need regular follow-up. And as discussed yesterday, there are issues of cost and radiation exposure. And at a simple practical level, being able to remind patients, oh, your two yearly scan is due. You've got to go and see your doctors. Doctors are very good at uh, dealing with patients who are in front of them. We're not so good at at patients who don't turn up for follow-up, who get lost. 
uh, because they haven't arrived in the clinic. And I know Bonnie might speak about this in her talk. I think nurse practitioners do this very well. Uh, they're very good at tracking down people who haven't shown up for their clinic visits. But doctors, in my experience, and speaking, for, you know, my own personal failing is I'm not so good at finding people who haven't turned up in my clinic. So we need to engage patients better. We need to be able to tell our patients in words that they understand about the importance of getting tested and getting screened and what that screening protocol is going to involve. And yes, the screening protocols themselves are evolving, um, but, and I, th I think there have been a couple of legitimately groundbreaking new uh, ways of, of imaging patients for early detection of these tumors. The first is you know, the widespread use now of rapid sequence MRI, uh, which I think a lot of you in this room are familiar with. But the second is the gallium data tape PET imaging. And uh, Lauren had her anecdote. I'll show you mine. It's exactly the same. A woman who presented to me with a head and neck paraganglioma, gallium data tape, picked up the unsuspected tumor in her abdomen, an abdominal paraganglioma. It's the abdominal paraganglioma that was going to kill her. That one came out, and that wouldn't have been discovered without the use of gallium dotate. It was a very small tumor. It's about a centimeter across. And so applying these screening algorithms for patients at risk is, are going to pick up these tumors early, and if we pick them up early, we're going to find, uh, be able to cure them. So I'm going to conclude by saying that uh, first res research agenda item was to identify the drivers of malignancy, and telomeres are undoubtedly, uh, undoubtedly important. We now need to develop targets to inhibit telomerase and make use of this information to patients' benefit. The second uh, regender I agenda item was to discover uh, new preclinical models. And the third uh, re future re uh, research focus needs to be to engage with our patients better so that they take better advantage of the screening protocols that are being evolved. And so I'd like to thank you for your attention, but also to highlight my lab, who does all of the work that I get to present uh, Dindy Ben, Trish Dwight, and my colleague and friend Anthony Gill, who's a pathologist, to thank all the many collaborators that I work with, in particular Carol Pachak uh, and Richard Tottle, um, Richard's at the University of Melbourne, to thank the generous sponsorship of the FIO Para Alliance, but also the Australian funding that we've had in the Para Difference Foundation. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. So I think I'm allowed to take questions. It was all too complicated, I can tell. <laughs> yes. Is cost an ongoing barrier to acquiring patients to study and patients to get treatment? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. One of the struggles I think we all have as an international partnership is understanding the local factors that uh, act as barriers for patients accessing treatment. So uh, as I understand from my discussions with many of you yesterday, there are very significant barriers of cost in accessing genetic testing and again some additional cost barriers in accessing imaging. So I think those are very real barriers and I do anything I can to support you in reducing those barriers. In my, in my country, Australia, the genetic testing is free for patients and the imaging is essentially free as well. So I think, and this is a very important part of making this accessible to the people who need it, uh, is to reduce those cost barriers. And so whatever I can do to support you, I'd be happy to try. So, uh, Dr. Kuzumba, I think uh, the title could have even been How to Get a PhD in P.O. Para <laughs> in less than an hour. Thank you for that wonderful talk. The telomer um, mm -hmm. is a wonderful thing uh, in so many ways. And I'm actually going to speak next about wellness and self-care. Mm -hmm. But the one thing I was thinking about was with telomeres, on the one hand, in wellness, we talk about how do you keep them long enough so that you can be healthy. And yet with cancers, the problem is they're too long, right. and that becomes a problem. Uh, so, you know, uh, I think an area of study in the future also, related in nutrition, uh, really has to do with when we talk about foods that are detrimental to telomere length, you know, can that be something that then can help us to fight cancer? 
um, so that we're actually becoming toxic for the cancer but keep the body healthier. Uh, I think that's a whole arena that we haven't really explored but could be fascinating. I, I agree with you. I think it is fascinating. And Dr. Pacek was very kind enough to share the advance notice that vitamin C might be important, and that's one aspect of nutrition. And uh, so I agree. I think nutrition is going to be important. For, the, for those of us with uh, grandchildren that are mm -hmm. currently have and being born, would there be any advantage to saving uh, cord blood and stem cells from the umbilical cord? Is that and banking those for yeah. futures in the family with S SDH mutations? I, I think that's an excellent idea. Um, I think it's important that we don't overpromise things about banking cord blood. I think it, so long as the cord blood can be banked inexpensively and securely, um, I think there's a lot we can do with cord blood in the future, but I don't want to try and overpromise something that is not in existence at the moment. But yes, a number of our patients have banked cord blood and we do the best we can to put them away in li liquid nitrogen and hold on to them as, until such time as they become real, uh, of potential real use back to the patients. So yes, if you can find a facility that can bank the cord blood inexpensively and securely, I'd, enc I'd encourage you to do so. Thanks for a great talk. Um, in the patients that develop metastatic disease, have you sequenced the recurrent tumor, and are these genes present in a higher proportion? That's a, or that's a really super question. That's a that's an absolute. Uh, you're on the nail. So most of the tumors that we have are the primary. So 70% of the tumors were the primary tumors, and as Lauren commented yesterday, that's actually really important because. That some of the, the genetic changes that affect telomere length are already apparent in the primary tumor before they've had the chance to spread. That's telling us something really important about the biology of these, of these mutations. But the second thing, point is exactly right too. Um, we, we are actually able to trace forward from those genetic events in the few cancers that we have, the 30% that are actually the metastatic lesions, and we can st start looking at their, essentially their biological history uh, from the time that they were the primary tumor through to the metastasis and looking to see what's changed along the way. So although the telomere uh, mutations were present very early, you're exactly right. We're extremely interested to see what changed after that and, and how that affects tumor biology. Great.